to play this pre-recorded talk by Luke and then we are going to switch to the person uh, to him in person to ask him questions. So let's go. Hello and welcome to a presentation on the LibreSoc Hybrid 3D GP CPU and GPU. Um, this is for the XDC 2020 conference. Uh, many thanks for inviting me to participate in this and also many thanks to NLNet for sponsoring this uh, project, the LibreSoc project under their privacy and enhanced trust program. The first thing I think, I think is why on earth will we make another uh, system on a chip, an SOC, um, in today's market? Well, given that we've got um, things like the Intel management engine um, uh, and AMD has a similar um, backdoor spine coprocessor in their uh, products, um, uh, given that we've, Apple found more QEA issues in Intel's um, Skylake recently than Intel found in Intel's Skylake recently, and with the yet more um, uh, um, uh, speculative executions, so it was only just last week, there's another set of um, uh, uh, speculative execution um, uh, vulnerabilities found. It's becoming just, uh, I feel sort of a duty of responsibility to um, try and uh, uh, do, do a alternative um, uh, alternative um, a processor myself. Um, we're running into um, the, where, where your typical SOC is um, heavily integrated, and as a result, um, uh, with the GPU and the VPU being on board, uh, the simplest solution that any uh, uh, average uh, fabulous semiconductor company will do, uh, Samsung, uh, Rockchip, or Winner Texas Instruments, is they will license a proprietary hard macro for the GPU and the VPU, and that comes with proprietary firmware that they have to uh, respect the uh, restrictive um, uh, secretive NDA on, on that uh, source code. Um, that's if they have access to it at all. Um, and consequently, you end up with a product that when, when the developers uh, create a uh, product um, uh, around that, you know, a game or whatever it is, um, you end up with opaque driver bugs. Um, and this has been ta did actually happen with the Samsung uh, S3C 6410, um, which had a special um, uh, proprietary uh, GPU developed by Samsung, um, where if you called the OpenGL initialization functions in the wrong order, um, you got a me memory corruption in a sick fault. And there's no way that you could know that that was going to happen um, because you didn't have access to the source code and you couldn't debug it. Um, so uh, it, it, it had a massive adverse effect on product development cost um, for the customers producing these these um, you know uh, uh, products. So the alternative was um, demonstrated by the uh, Intel and Valve Steam collaboration, uh, which on the the 2012 uh, blog post. So they said it was the most productive business meeting they'd ever had. Um, and it required no NDAs, no involvement of other than contacting their immediate managers, um, no third party agreements, no lawyers, nothing. They just phoned each other, got permission from their respective managers, and went off to have a business meeting. Um, and consequently, both of them uh, got huge improvements in their respective code bases, both the Intel uh, driver team and the Valve uh, Steam team, um, uh, uh, massively increased the uh, productivity in their, in their own code bases. So, you know, I'm trying to emphasize here the um, the impact that um, uh, proprietary development has. It's not a good um, thing. It has a, a huge uh, uh, real effect on um, uh, 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 you know, businesses. Um, the other reason why I know the system on chips because for 30 years I've always wanted to develop a CPU. Um, but ultimately, this is a strategic business objective to develop entirely Libra hardware, firmware, and drivers. So why, we're using open power, but why? Um, when you're considering doing your own instruction set, um, at your own processor, you need you need to be realistic about it, um, and um, uh, you need to think in terms of when I present this to customers, uh, uh, are they going to accept it? Are they going to going to to, uh, to, to like it? And if there's no ecosystem uh, surrounding your, your chip, then not only have you shot yourself in the foot um, as far as presenting yourself with a 20 plus man year development um, uh, cost, uh, at the end of that, none of your customers are going to buy it because there's no buy-in, there's no Linux kernel, there's no thing, no, no other customers are using it, and there's no ecosystem. So you need Linux kernel, U-boot, compilers and operating systems, and reference implementations to already exist. Um, you need the support of a founder foundation um, and the members in that foundation. Um, in particular, what we're intending to do is to submit um, augmentations to instruction set, and those need to be done pro properly by being probably peer reviewed um, uh, by uh, the members and by the foundation. So that you need to support a foundation of members. Um, because we're funded by analytics under their privacy enhanced trust program, um, 
there has to be no NDAs and full transparency has to be acceptable. So no secretive working groups, no closed mailing lists, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, the Open Power Foundation are, have demonstrated that they're um, amenable to that. Um, they're extremely approachable and friendly. Um, but it also has the advantage that the uh, power instruction set has been established for um, over two decades. Um, and we have MicroWatt as a reference platform, which provide, proved extraordinarily valuable. Um, the people behind it, the team behind it, are so knowledgeable. I mean, I mean it's, it's a privilege to work with them. So what goes into a typical SOC? You normally will have uh, a fully integrated set of peripherals. It is not a Northbridge, Southbridge design, which you typically see in um, an Intel processor. Um, and it's nothing like the IBM Tower Power 9 and Power 10 core, where you have um, uh, high performance um, IO and PCI Express and not really very much else. Um, your typical um, system on a chip will go on, including the power management chip and the memory chip, which will be a 3D uh, stacked um, uh, DRAM and NAND flash on top. Uh, your typical um, PCB size is 30 millimeters by 40 millimeters. I don't let that sink in. It's normally the size that's, that's smaller than your average Intel BGA uh, processor and definitely smaller than your average um, your IBM power core. Right. So the entire package is fit between 15 to 20 millimeters BGA. Uh, power consumption is 2.2 to two and a half to five watt power consumption, um, which means that you can use a plastic um, FBGA package. You don't even need a metal uh, top on it and you don't need a heat sink. This overall simplifies the design drastically and cuts down the cost on development for uh, the PCBs and product development for the um, for your customers. So you have uh, things like USB 2, USB 3, HDMI, um, RGB TTL, MIPI, uh, a, a micro SD, uh, uh, lots of these, I squared, lots of I squared Cs, lots of UARTs, uh, full and uh, partial, lots of SBIs, including quad, um, you have GPIO, external interrupts, PWM, uh, audio built in typically, um, although uh, it's usually uh, AC97 compliant I, I2S for connection to external Maxim chips, etc., etc., um, and Akai uh, audio chips, um, although some will actually have analog um, HD converter on board um, with uh, um, uh, uh, headphone and, um, uh, and line in, line out, etc., etc., um, because those those chips, uh, those audio chips, will typically be about you know sometimes between one and three dollars, and the actual processor is selling for between uh, two dollars fifty and uh, uh, you know uh, four dollars, uh, uh, or sometimes up, up to thirty miles. But it depends on the market. So, for example, the Freescale uh, uh, quad core IMX6 sells for 30 35 dollars, um, uh, whereas the uh, Ingenic JZ4775 is at the $2.50 mark. So it is a completely different kind of market from your average Intel processor, AMD processor, or IBM Power 9 or Power 10 core. Oh, um, and there's also a built in GPU and built in PPU on a shared memory bus. It doesn't even have separate m uh, memory lines uh, uh, for, the, for the GPU, it's an internally a shared, a shared bus architecture. So this is what you'd have to typically see inside your simple single board computer style uh, Raspberry Pi. I don't like the, 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 the term, but it's, it's your credit card size computer board. Um, the processor would obviously take up a, you know, about one percent or five percent of the, of the uh, space on that board. Um, memory would take up another ten percent. Um, power management about a third of the board. Um, and um, it, so you'd have uh, video processing. Um, uh, our instructions and 3D instructions actually built into the core. All right. Um, so we are doing uh, an open power out of order instruction set multi issue where the simple V vector, uh, vector extension, um, which I'll explain later on, um, is part of that um, uh, um, uh, thing, but it's actually part of the augmentation of the power instruction set, um, which we will need to get approval uh, from Open Power Foundation before we can release it. Now we have to go through a proper process with this. Um, then you'd have uh, that core be connected to Axi4, uh, wishbone buses and bridges, etc., etc., and then you would have your peripherals and your uh, memory. Now um, here, you, the, this pin set, as you can see with uh, many of the Texas Instruments and Samsung um, things, if you've read the technical manuals, um, you'll find that there's like a, a thousand, a thousand five hundred um, uh, in pins of actual functions, but the actual number of pins is um, way smaller of that because if you have a thousand pin package, you end up with um, it's just too big and it's too costly, um, and the yields are low, much lower um, on the larger packages. So um, what you do instead is you have this pin mux, um, which takes those thousand pins and uh, uh, multiplexes them down to say 200, 250, or you know, 150 um, uh, external um, I/O pins, and then in software in the GPIO in the kernel in Duboot, um, you set which of those functions you want to be. So you want pin 
uh, A5 to be I squared C clock, um, or you want it to be on a nut, somebody else, another customer would uh, set that to be uh, UART transmit, uh, UART zero TX. Um, and that's all software, software program kernel level um, or in embedded operating system. Um, and in this way, you can design a chip which has multiple markets, multiple potential target markets. So one chip, 15 different customers uh, or customer markets. I, which then increases the uh, probability that your um, chip is actually going to be successful because you're not critically dependent on one customer only. So what's specifically different, different about, about LibreSock? Well, the first thing is, the uh, most critically important thing is that it's a hybrid integrated uh, CPU, GPU, VPU. The CPU is the GPU. The GPU is the CPU. And likewise for the VPU. So there is no separate VPU, GPU, pipeline, or core. We are actually modifying augmenting the power instruction set to add vectorization suitable for 3D GPU and VPU usage, and then augmenting um, the instruction set itself to add um, uh, 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 targeted instructions for those specific purposes. Uh, I apologize, I have to emphasize that because it's, 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 it takes quite a long time for people to get uh, across to people. And I've, I've talked about it, and then six months later, they've gone, so you're doing a separate GPU, are you? It's like, no, we're not, we're not. <laughs> um, uh, thing. Um, I'll explain. I'll go over the other points and then come back to that and explain why that's significant. I think the second second thing is that it's written in Namibian, which is a Python-based AGL. We did several um, weeks of comprehensive analysis um, uh, uh, of uh, alternative uh, HDLs. So it's not BHDL. It is not Verilog. And definitely not Chisel three or Scalar. Um, this is actually an extremely important strategic decision, which we'll go into a bit later. But um, Verilog is designed um, from the 1980s. It was actually designed for test purposes, for unit tests. Um, it was only after it had been designed for unit tests that somebody noticed that actually you could write the HDL itself in Verilog as well. And that's how it took off. Um, VHDL is much more gate level design, but it has the advantage that it can include records. Um, uh, but ultimately, and this is one of the reasons why Chisel um, uh, uh, was done, is you cannot do object oriented programming on top of Verilog or VHDL. Um, they are 1980s basic and Fortran style um, uh, programming languages uh, that have not evolved um, uh, as the rest of software engineering um, uh, uh, software development practices have, have uh, get up. Uh, Chisel is uh, uh, just, <laughs> you take one look at it, I've, I've done dozens of programming languages and I still cannot read Chisel. You know, I, can, I, I didn't learn Java, um, I looked at it and I can read it. That's one of the reasons why people, um, why it became so popular, Java became so popular. And uh, Python likewise became popular because it's readable by humans. Um, um, uh, Chisel is just, it, it isn't. Um, so despite the fact that it has these object oriented capabilities, it's unusable. Um, so um, we need the object oriented capabilities, and uh, uh, Python was the most obvious uh, choice um, uh, 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 to, to, to pick. Um, the other thing that's different is that we're using our own vector extension, uh, which is called Simple V. And you have to have a look at um, an article online on Sigarch, um, uh, which you can find with Cindy Considered Harmful, and it explains the um, uh, emphasizes that the setup and teardown costs of uh, SIMD are so insane um, that it's just why we're doing this. And, and I'll, I'll show an exa example um, uh, later on. But ultimately, uh, SimpleV is like a hardware for loop on the stand a standard scalar instruction set. So uh, if you can think in, in terms of, of pausing the program counter, then doing a sub counter loop from naught to the vector length, incrementing the uh, scalar register numbers by one each time, uh, you get the, they get the general idea. And conceptually, it's very similar to zero over overhead loops in DSPs. So just coming back to uh, the thing about the, um, the, the the hybrid um, uh, GPU. I apologize, I've forgotten what it was. I was going to say that's that's moving swiftly on. <laughs> so we have a um, we're basing it on a hybrid architecture um, using an augmented CDC sixty six hundred as the inspiration. So whilst the CDC six hundred itself is designed from the nineteen sixty five, the augmentations that we are putting on top of it are not. So with help from Mitch Olsup on comp.arch, who spent six months uh, very kindly um, explaining to me how the 6600s and scoreboard systems work, we've add, we're adding precise exceptions, multi-issue, and much more. So um, the academic literature on the 6600 is completely misleading. I, I'm not kidding. I've, I've had to do a, um, a comprehensive article 
um, explaining uh, the how to morph the Tomasulo algorithm, which is the one that is believed in the academic literature to be the canonical way of doing out of order. I've had to write an article explaining to people how um, to morph that, topolo topologically morph that into 6600, preserving all of the capabilities of the Tomasulo algorithm, but without the overhead of the cost of the, of the CAMs um, and the disadvantages of using uh, binary addressing. Um, that article, if anybody's interested, I can uh, point you at it. Um, but basically, it comes down to the fact that Seymour Cray, because they were so early, um, they solved problems that they didn't realize actually existed elsewhere. And consequently, what they didn't do in the literature or in the patent is actually highlight the fact that they'd created register renaming because they didn't realize that register naming was a problem. They just solved it. It's kind of ironic that it's taken 50 years for this to come to light. So um, the, the, we're putting on the Cray style vector uh, front end on the instruction set, but at the back end, we're doing predicated masked SIMD. Um, so um, there's this little interpreter loop um, in the instruction decoder, which sits, you know, sits between the instruction decode and issue, which effectively does that for loop, throwing it out multiple um, instructions into the um, multi-issue engine, some of which can be SIMD'd, SIMD-ified, um, that um, uh, give us the appearance of having vector front end, but without all of the disadvantages that come with a SIMD um, uh, uh, instruction set. So this out of order execution um, combined with multi-issue combined with symbol V allows uh, developers to think in scalar operations, um, but they're turned into SIMD at the back end without the developer actually needing to do SIMD and now poisoning the entire code base um, with these uh, set up and tear down um, uh, 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 um, uh, code fragments. And then on top of that, what we were doing is adding IEEE 754 sine, cosine, 8 and 2, log 1 P, um, normalization opcodes, uh, texturization, which uh, texturization in uh, 3D GPUs, you have four um, X, Y, uh, 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 you, you know, you have four values representing naught, 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 one, one naught, and one, one on a two-dimensional grid, and then you have two parameters x and y from naught to one, which you interpolate the four points um, for uh, uh, the texture things, and, and you get a graded um, uh, 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 pixel value back. So it's particularly complex um, uh, interpolation involved, um, which we've got to add as, as hardware because if we don't add it as hardware, we're going to end up. Um, not being sufficiently um, high pixel per clock rate to be commercially viable. Um, and then we'd be also adding YUV to RGB, um, which could be used for both the um, video um, decode and for audio, potentially, if we get the encoding uh, right, uh, but also for the um, uh, 3D um, uh, uh, pixelation as well. And thanks to, to SimpleV, we only have to develop these as um, in scalar form, um, and it will be automatically vectorized by the simple V uh, extension. So why the heck are we using Numigen? I mean, yeah, any any other team would go, oh, we'll use scalar, we'll use VHDL, or whatever it is. Now, um, Numigen uses Python to build an abstract syntax tree in memory, uh, which then hands that over to Yosis uh, for creation, for blind creation of ilang files, and you then use Yosis to do uh, create it, turn it into Verilog if you want, and hand it over to standard synthesis tools, um, or you can um, uh, put it straight into um, free software tools, for example, using the Versa ECP5 for FPGA, um, using NextPNR. Um, we, we don't have any proprietary tools in, in, in this at all. So it's part of the free software tool chain. Um, but ultimately, we can use um, uh, Python object-oriented programming techniques um, in, in, in a thing. So, um, coming through the, the list of slides here, we get deterministic synthesizable behavior. Um, so, uh, in Namigen, signals are declared with their reset pattern, so there's no more forgetting the if reset block in uh, your VHDL or your Verilog because it's back in the declaration of the signal, and Namigen automatically creates the if reset um, uh, for you behind the scenes on your behalf. And if you forget to add it, it defaults to zero. So um, uh, a, a huge number of the uh, problems associated with um, Verilog and VHDL just go away. Um, so again, as we can use Python object-oriented programming techniques. Um, so we can use standard Python classes and functions, um, which you can pass in parameters. It's completely dependent on what the type of HDL is created. 
And in this way, uh, we've created an, an IEEE 754 floating point pipeline library, um, where the size of the um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the IEEE floating point, whether it's FP16, 3264, is just a parameter. <laughs> right. um, it's exactly the same code, and this drastically reduces the um, the um, amount of code that we then have to maintain. We don't have um, a separate floating point pipeline. We don't have a separate 32-bit um, uh, pipeline, 64, and a separate 80-bit and a separate 128-bit um, one. It's all the same code. Right. See, you know, a software engineer would think of this, but a hardware thing, an H, a hardware engineer would not. Right? Because they're restricting their mindset to um, uh, uh, HDL and thinking in terms of, you know, I have to write the code by hand um, uh, and thing. So we can also play, apply Python-based for loops to, say, for example, read the CSV file and iterate over that in Python and generate the abstract, abstract syntax tree to create a hierarchical recursive nested suite of HDL switch and state, case statements. And that's how we've implemented the LibreSoft Power Instruction Set Decoder, Power Asset Decoder. In a more extreme case, we're actually using object OA abstraction. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the overloading of underscore, underscore, add, underscore, underscore um, in Python, etc. It's in the similar things for subtract and add and greater than, etc., etc. You can create your own class where if you do A plus B, X equals A plus B, um, under the scenes, scene, uh, behind the scenes, Python will call X equals A dot underscore, underscore, add, underscore, underscore, brackets B on your behalf. So you can think in terms of a simple thing of, you know, I'm adding A to B, but underneath, just like in C++ operator overlo overloading, you're doing something completely different. And so what we're using that to do is to do these dynamic partition signals where the there is a context associated with it, which breaks the signal down, the 64-bit signal, down into 32, 2 times 32, 4 times 16, or 8 times 64. And so we can have dynamic partition SIMD, but still looks like we're doing X equals A plus B, right? And as a result, we don't have this insane uh, switch statement in uh, uh, the top level of code, expanding every single statement or single statement into a massive series of, of, of suites of switch statements, or having multiple identical versions of the exact same code, one for 8-bit SIMD, one for 16-bit SIMD, one for 32, and finally one for 64-bit in scalar. It's literally going to be the same code with this uh, abs OO abstraction um, on top. I, 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 I don't understand why, why this hasn't been thought of um, before when you're in an industry um, uh, standard practice. So why are we doing another vector instruction set? Well, SIMD, strictly speaking, is not another um, SIMD instruction set. It's a register tagging system, and consequently, there are no opcodes, additional opcodes. There is no floating point 16 add. There is only scalar add with the vector hardware for loop hidden behind the scenes. So we're tagging scalar operations operating on the scalar reg file as vectorized. Now, the consequence for this is that we can completely discard the power instruction set SIMD, um, which is 700 opcodes. And to give you some idea, we've implemented um, the um, same uh, instruction set as Microsoft at the moment, which is the integer uh, things, and that's 300 instructions. Floating point adds about another 100 to 150. And then when you enter implement VSX, it's a whopping 700 additional opcodes. And this is pretty normal for SIMD. All right, but it makes it extremely unlikely for us to be able to fit a power instruction set decoder into only one clock cycle. Already, without us having added in um, um, uh, uh, the floating point uh, scalar instructions, we're at 4,000 gates for the power ISA decoder, which is larger than um, some um, RISC processors. <laughs> okay, so we really don't want to do power uh, power uh, SIMD. So, it, as I said, it's effectively a hardware subcounter for loop, which pauses the program counter and then incrementally rolls through the operand uh, register numbers, issuing multiple scalar instructions into the pipelines. And this is the reason why we're doing a multi. Uh, we're doing this on top of a multi-issue out of order microarchitecture because we can shelf these um, uh, multiple uh, 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 scalar instructions into those pipelines, and this in out of order engine will take care of it. Um, we also did another advantage of SimpleV is that current and future power instruction scalar opcodes inherently and automatically become vectorized by SimpleV without needing a new explicit new vector opcode because it's automatic. 
um, even predication and element po element with polymorphism are also tags. So the element with polymorphism allows us to have floating points 16 and 80 and 128 without modify added to the instruction set, the power ISO instruction set, without modifying the power instruction set. Because you just say, well, this 64-bit um, floating point add operation for the duration of this uh, this operation, instead we're going to do floating point 16. It's real simple. So just to give you a quick refresh on, on SIMD, it's very, very easy to implement um, in hardware and consequently it's extremely seduct seductive. The parallelism is in the ALU. Um, it's not in the um, the instruction decode or anything like that. So there's um, zero to, uh, to negligible impact on the rest of the core. All right. But where it goes wrong, as, it's, as illustrated in that uh, simply considered harmful thing, is the setup and corner cases make it, it extremely complex. Um, so the hardware is easy, but the software is absolute hell. Right? And this applies to 3D GPUs just as much. Right? Um, and I've just encountered um, a, a Stunner copy uh, patch uh, to Power9, which was added last month. It's 250 handwritten lines of assembly code. And for RISC-V RVV and for Simple V, which are based on the Cray vector length um, uh, concept, Strunner copy is 14 one four instructions. Let's sink in for a moment. All right, 250 handwritten assembly lines versus 14. All right. The other thing is that you actually have an order n to the six opcode proliferation, which results in thousands of instructions. Um, uh, so you have the, the opcode itself, so whether it's an add, a, um, a multiply, um, or a, a et cetera, et cetera. You have the element width, so you have whether that's a, a, an add, a 16-bit, an 8-bit, a 32, or 64. You have the vector length, which in um, uh, um, now uh, Intel has gone up to 512-bit vector AVX. I mean, it's mental. Um, you have whether the source one or the source two and the destination are scalar or vector, and all the permutations of those, all right? And you have some cases where you want to select the high or the low bit of the result. So um, uh, this is typically done in 16-bit um, audio processing. You, when you do the multiply, you want to select the high result of the multiply um, uh, rather than the low, and you consequently have these permutations of things. It's four permutations of what you can have of whether you want to multi Yeah, it's just, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, um, and then you have the selection between the scalar file, you have copy instructions, uh, move to and from scalar to register, um, scalar to vector, vector to scalar, uh, uh, scalar to predicate, predicate to scalar, predicate to vector, vector to predicate. It's mental. Um, and we can avoid um, all of it um, uh, with, with this register tagging system. So uh, just to illustrate that um, simple V in a nutshell thing, note that this is the add instruction. It's a scalar add instruction, not a vector add. It just happens to have been augmented. The scalar add has been augmented so that if the registers are tagged as vectorized, it automatically goes into this vector loop. So normally what you would do is you would have uh, for scalar operation, VL would be set to 1. All right, so that you would only have one instruction issued into the uh, execution uh, engine and uh, predication would be disabled. All right. However, should you enable uh, VL, vector length set it to 4, 8, um, or even 7, or 19, um, then it goes into this hardware for loop um, where on the first iteration, you get what we would expect to be your standard scalar instruction. But on the second loop, it goes, if the um, destination register is, is vectorized, then increment the destination register number, which is used there. And if the uh, first source operand is vectorized, um, then increment that and that and add it on to this register number, all right? And the second operand likewise. likewise. So you can still, inherently you can see that for a very, very simple implementation, which there's virtually no impact on the amount of hardware that's required, you simply have to add this counter, just um, you know, a program, a sub program counter, shoving instructions, going around, shoving extra instructions into the issue engine, and it becomes extremely simple to uh, 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 conceptually and in hardware and also in the uh, cycle actor simulators to um, add uh, this um, for loop in to um, uh, create um, a, a simple version of the uh, a, a simple uh, uh, um, compliant implementation. It gets more complex when you want to uh, uh, parallelize that, but this is why we're doing the out of order engine engine um, because we just shove it at the thing and the out of order engine goes and sorts out the parallelism for us.
Um, I left out uh, register indirection and a whole stack of other things, but also I left out um, elements, element width overrides, which I'll cover later. Um, so your scalar scalar, scalar vector and vector vector are now all combined into the same instruction. You haven't had to add a scalar a vector um, SIMD instruction or a vector vector SIMD thing. It's the same. Thing. It's scalar add, right? So again, um, the out of order may push, choose to push their adds into instruction queue, which makes it very busy. And consequently, you have an extremely compact way to express instructions. And that, in turn, saves you on instruction cache and saves power, All right? So um, the, another example here is we, we're overloading the meaning of what a branch instruction is um, by turning it into predication. All right. So instead of um, the first thing you do is you check to see whether the registers are vectorized. All right. Um, and if they're scalar, then you go jump to the branch or conditionally or whatever it is you're doing in your normal branch operation. But if it's not, then you do not do a branch. Instead, you treat it as a predication uh, an opportunity to calculate a predicate using um, the source one and the source two for your uh, uh, register for your for your branch uh, to do a compare, all right, and to store the result in uh, a predicate register, all right. So we're kind of changing the meaning of what a branch is, but we're doing it um, through the tagging. So if the registers are tagged as vectorized, then it does the predicated form. Otherwise, it behaves exactly like a scalar branch. All right. So um, predication is stored in the integer register file as a bit field. Um, uh, we have scalar vector and vector vector pre um, uh, predicate computation uh, supported. Um, uh, but also, um, we aim to overload the branch immediate to be the predication target. It's complicated, it's it, uh, thing, but it, I just I wanted to give you the um, sort of a, a, a high-level overview of, um, of what we're seeing when we, uh, details are in the actual implementation. So um, the other thing that we're doing is um, similar to MMX, but done slightly better. Um, and to uh, Power9 VSX um, in some of the uh, low um, power um, uh, simpler uh, versions. So we're actually typecasting the register files um, with a union. All right. So uh, we sort of treat the register file as if it was a byte level SRAM. All right. Where um, uh, again, our process is you know, C, C pseudocode. So we have 128 um, registers, which are of type reg, reg underscore T, where um, for in, on most intents and purposes, it looks like it's a, 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 a 64 bits, you know, eight by eight, eight eight bit um, actual uh, bytes. Um, but the addition is this union um, here, where um, we can override the um, element width with a, red, a tag on the uh, register to say that actually, I know you're you're doing uh, this is uh, a normally uh, nominally a 64 bit add, but actually I want you to treat register A as a SIMD array of 8-bit <laughs> uh, things starting at the uh, point in the register file, um, which would, is normally associated with that 64-bit um, uh, scalar register. Um, Implementation-wise, this requires us to have byte-level select lines on the uh, internal SRAM, which, given that you know Wishbone, it's exactly what Wishbone does. Um, you have um, uh, uh, can have uh, up to a byte-level um, uh, granularity on these uh, select lines. It's it's no skin off our nose to do this in in, in, in terms of hardware. The only thing is that um, for 64-bit scalar writes, you have to enable um, all eight um, uh, select lines to get at the 64-bit data because it's byte-level selects. So um, the default default behavior is that your elements, they're not elements, but you know what I mean, your elements behave as, as defined by the standard instruction set. And for integer oper operands, there's an override which turns it into 8, 16, or 32-bit SIMD. So for 8-bit, it would use that. For 16-bit, it would use that. For 32-bit, it would use that. And when it's default and, and SIMD, uh, default uh, width, it would use that. So it, it's as if you had that array, which comes back to basically doing this. All right. Um, so it typecasts the register file to its union of arrays. Um, and for floating point, RGB 754 floating point, we can add floating point 16 um, and later uh, uh, 80 or 128 bit um, without adding actual floating point um, uh, 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 16 instructions to the instruction set. Consequently, this drastically simplifies and keeps the decoder simple. And consequently, we, we reduce the power and standard chance of actually being able to do the instruction decode, power instruction decode in a single clock cycle. So it, 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 all of these things have to be taken into consideration in this in this design. Um, so again, it does not require modification of the actual ISA. Uh, 
conceptually, I don't know if you're familiar with the mill architecture, but it's exactly the same thing. So the mill architecture, they do not, they don't even have a floating point add 16 or int add 16 or floating point add 32 or 64 or int 32 or 64 add. It's just add. All right. And the tag of what the type of the register is, is taken from the load instruction. So you specify at the load instruction whether the it is 8, 16, 32, or 64 bit. You specify at the load instruction whether it is integer or floating point or complex numbers or bit. Actually, they can actually do bit level addition. Um, it's really wow, um, well worth looking up if you're interested in architectures. And that tag goes right the way through until you do the store. It's a fascinating design, and consequently, the instruction set is extremely compact because there is no floating point add, no 16 bolt add, there's just add and multiply. Um, so uh, we can't do that because we're at extreme level because we've, we're working on top of an existing instruction set. But at least what we can do is say that the floating point add 64, we can tag it to say, actually, I want you to do a floating point 16 add or an array, a SIMD array of, um, a, a floating point 16 for a place, but without having to add an FB add 16 opcode. That's really important. So, uh, no, one other thing to say is that um, when the vector length is, say, 3 or 12 um, uh, and the element is 16, normally that would take up only 48 bits of the um, of the VL equals 3 and element is 16. That would take up only 48 bits of a 64-bit uh, register. What we do not do is zero the upper 16 bits. They are untouched. All right, so reg file ra dot s, s being the 16 T thing here um, in that union. Um, that is not zero, it is not touched. And in the hardware, it means that bits uh, six and seven of the select lines are disabled. And those go directly to the uh, predicate line. So inherently, the predicate bits at the top, which are not touched by the uh, VL, um, are left at zero. Um, some additional features on uh, and simple v um, include fail on first. Um, fail on first is um, something that um, is extremely significant, has been discovered to be extremely significant, and has been added to ARM's um, SVE uh, and SVE2. Um, uh, basically, if you have a look at the, you can find the patch on the GLibc um, uh, mailing list for Power 9 VSX Twitter copy. Um, when you get to the top of the um, page boundary of the memory of, the, of that you're doing, VSX is 16, 16 bytes. And if you start the Stringer copy within 15 bytes of the end of the uh, uh, page, you will automatically get a sec fault. And consequently, the very well-written um, assembly code, 240, 250 lines of it, completely fails to um, uh, when um, you, you, you try to um, uh, use this uh, strip container copy assembly routine at the top limit of the of the memory. So what a fail on first does, and this can only be really be done when you have predication, which Power9 does not have in its SIMD. Um, you can only do this with predication or vector length, is you go, when the, um, when the load would fail, what I would like you to do is simply, instead of issuing a seg fault, is to simply truncate, automatically truncate the predication um, or the vector length to the last item which will be successfully succeed. And consequently, all other operations in that loop will be truncated and will succeed within the bounds, uh, in parallel, will succeed within that now limited range of operation, including the store. Um, and this is extremely, extremely important um, uh, uh, to to have in a vector instruction set. Um, uh, if you don't want to go, have to do the if well, well it might succeed, uh, might fail, so I'm going to have to put a detection in the loop, and you're wasting instructions. All right. So um, it, it fail on first does away with the need to do that, and it's extremely important. The other thing, which is so something which is which is accidentally added, um, is something called twin predication. And on things like move, uh, move instruction between move between two registers, uh, you get we, we're applying a predicate to the source register and a completely separate predicate to the destination register. And in combination with setting one of those to scalar and one of them to uh, vector, or both to vector and vector, this combination covers all of the traditional vector operations, vsplat, vgather, scatter, um, index, etc., reduce, etc., etc. Um, all of them are covered by twin predication. Right. So again, we don't have to add vgather, vsplat, flat, etc., etc., et because it's, 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 it's uh, to the uh, instruction set because it's already covered. 
So the other thing that we're doing is we're doing this um, uh, what's called SV prefix, which is which is um, um, embedded by Jacob. Uh, Jacob um, uh, is one, one of our team members, um, and it's a 16-bit and 32-bit prefix on the scalar operations. Um, so um, which turn the 32-bit um, operation into a vector operation. Um, so um, SVP64, um, obviously having many more bits, allows for a much more extensive tag augmentation of the um, of the scalar instructions than the 16-bit uh, prefix does, which is SVP48. Um, the other one is, uh, um, which is much more advanced and is still, still in development, is VBlock, which is sort of like VLIW, and it's a context which allows uh, space for um, uh, 3D uh, R brand uh, swizzle and things like that uh, to be uh, uh, tags in the things. And ultimately, what we're doing is it's a hardware compression algorithm for instruction sets. Um, the ultimate goal being of which being to cut on instruction cache usage and therefore cutting down on power. Um, it's actually really significant because I, I'm not sure if you're aware, but if you were to, uh, uh, this happened with um, ARM64, is that um, the increase in the register sizes and the data sizes automatically inherently increased these, uh, the uh, instruction size to the point where they had a 10% increase in power consumption for the exact same code compiled for the, uh, the alternative operating system because the code no longer fitted into a 32K or 64K cache. And consequently, to get the same level of performance, um, ARM had to recommend that everybody increase their caches by 50%. And that 50% um, uh, increase in cache size actually results in a 100% increase in power consumption. Right? It's really significant. So, um, and for a typical GPU which has its own instruction cache and very small shaders, um, this, there's no problem. There's, you, know, you can have um, 128 VLIW um, because those 128 um, four 32-bit instructions um, operating in parallel do four floating-point operations each. When you're getting 16 floating-point operations for a 128-bit um, uh, instruction uh, set, that's a fantastic um, um, value for money. Um, but for us, it has a massive impact. 128-bit instructions would have a massive impact um, on the uh, uh, um, workload uh, for the uh, scalar operations because it's a shared instruction cache, which is a hybrid CPU. There is no separate um, GPU iCache. And so consequently, we really need to have to pay attention to these kinds of things. And uh, thing. it's real. <laughs> Architecture design is, is really, you have to do a hell of a lot of comprehensive um, uh, uh, considerations. Um, it's really complex. Um, but critically, all of these things need to go through Open Power, Power Foundation for official approval. So um, the summary then is that our goal is to create a mass volume, low power embedded system on a chip, suitable for use in netbooks, smartphones, Chromebooks, tablets, smartphones, IoT, single board computers, and blah, blah, blah. Um, basically, if you're familiar with Raspberry Pi processor, um, with all winner A64, with the rock chip RK3399, that's our, our target. All right. Um, there is no way that we could implement a project of this magnitude without using NIMIGEN um, because we're able to compactify the code using Python object or in OO techniques uh, to create our HDL. Collaboration with the Open Power Foundation and its members is absolutely essential. There are no shortcuts here. Uh, the standards have to be developed and ratified um, uh, 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 by the Open Power Foundation, not just for us, um, so, but so that everyone benefits from the augmentations that we're doing for adding um, uh, sine and cosine, IEEE 754 sine and cosine, um, uh, etc. So we'll be, you know, if that made it into Power 11, um, would be absolutely um, uh, fantastic, a huge benefit to uh, well beyond just um, our, um, uh, our, um, our, pro our project and our product. So we're working on the back of the huge stability of the power ecosystem, which is 20, 25 years now uh, ongoing. Um, the approach that we're taking is, is to greatly simplify the open 3D and video driver, uh, drivers, um, uh, reduces uh, product development costs for customers, uh, a la um, uh, uh, Val Steel collaboration showed. Um, and it just happens to be fascinating, deeply rewarding, uh, and technically challenging. Um, and it's funded by Eleanor. NLNet, uh, which is brilliant. So if anybody would like to um, help and get involved, um, we actually have funding where you could actually be paid to work on something this, 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 um, that is like this. So that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Any questions? Um, and if there's any uh, discussion, uh, we have a, a mailman mailing list, uh, list.libra.sock.org. Um, we have a free node IONC channel, hash libra-sock. Uh, website is uh, libra-sock.org. And um, if anybody has any ideas or wants to apply for uh, funding they, uh, for anything to do with privacy and enhanced trust, um, just go to nlnet.nl's website. Thank you very much. Thank you.
So that's it for the presentation and we have look here in person. We are already on time, but uh, like probably he will be able to answer one or two questions. And let's start with probably the most common one you hear. So why not risk five? <laughs> oh, goodness me. Um, I spent, I have to be quite diplomatic here. Um, I spent um, 18 months um, attempting uh, to um, uh, get, basically, we're funded by Enonet, um, and we have uh, full transparency. is a hard requirement for um, uh, the development, the full development of our processor. And unfortunately, um, uh, Risk Five is developed using closed mailing lists and closed working groups, and that is completely completely incompatible with the transparency requirements uh, for a processor. Imagine um, that, you know, basically we're developing a secure processor, um, you know, DRM free, uh, spyware free, um, and we would get questions uh, from our customers saying, you're developing the instruction sets in total secrecy. How, can, how in hell's name can we trust you? Um, and it would be game over completely. We'll be uh, quite rightly accused of total hypocrisy. Um, and so constantly, we, very sadly, we couldn't do it, but it's trying for 18 months to, um, to get them to understand. They just stonewalled and failed to answer absolutely every single time. Okay, I guess we can squeeze one more. That was a really nice answer. So how do you achieve the parallelism needed to run shaders on your CPU slash GPU without single instruction multiple data? And does that result uh, perform up to on par with what it would be if uh, they were seamed? Right. Um, so, um, as I mentioned in, in talk, it's it's a vector front end, um, but a SIMD predicated back end. So, what Simple V does is it sits in between the instruction decode phase and the instruction issue phase, do, doing um, work out whether the um, instruction, in combination with that uh, VL. Uh, uh, for loop can issue that 8-bit vector to the SIMD hardware backend. Um, so you get the both advantages of um, the simplification in the, the assembly level of uh, VL, as I described in that SIMD considered harmful um, thing, you know, with the Cray vector things. But at the use, as hardware engineers, we can still uh, greatly simplify the design of the hardware by still doing predicated SIMD, but it's just you, it's not exposed to the um, at the API level, uh, a, aka the instruction set. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation and for your work on OpenSoC, and uh, we will have uh, another presentation soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.